I'm extremely excited today um, because we're starting a new series, and uh, I, I, just, I just love what we're going to be talking about, and it's, it's just something that uh, when Steve told me we were going to be talking about, I was, I was extremely excited. Um, have you guys ever had an intense or intentional conversation? Anybody out there? You know what I'm talking about? Like a you have somebody who's around you, right? And you lock eyes with them, and it doesn't matter what's going on outside of that conversation, outside of, you know, whatever situation's going on, it's, it's you and that person. And whatever information you're conveying or they're conveying, it's, it's going right there direct, right? I thought about one that I had, and it was about seven years ago. Picture me at 19 years old, I just finished my uh, first semester at Bible college. I came back home to my home church to do a student ministry internship. And about a month into that, we took our kids to CIY. And uh, we went to Milligan College in Tennessee, in Johnson City up there. And uh, we, we went to this watering hole, like the second or third day that we were there. And, and the guy that was my mentor, Matt Smith, he is, one thing you should know about him, he's as blind as a bat without his glasses on. And so basically what we did at this watering hole, it was like a rock formation, it was a freshwater spring, and you climb up this rock formation, it's about 20 foot up, and you jump off and get in the water and you laugh about it, whatever, right? Well, he goes up there and he tells the guy to hold his glasses as he's getting ready to jump off. And so he hands his glasses off, almost immediately he slips. And so he kind of does like the backslide off the cliff and like kind of goes, and it's just one of these slow motion things where I'm like, oh, oh no, this is not happening. This is that, oh, he's falling. Oh my gosh, that's 15 feet. He just smacks right onto a rock shelf underneath. And, and it rolls off. You could tell he was hurt. And so we have kids go in and we swim over and we grab them out of the water and we bring them out. And, and I go over to them and we load them into the van. And it was, it was the only adults were Matt, another lady who was a sponsor, and myself. And Matt looks at me and he says, Matt, I need you to do one thing. He said, I'm going to the hospital. I'm probably done for the week. I need you to do one thing. And at 19 years old, I'm like, what? He's like, I need you to take care of the kids. You're trusting 15 kids that are teenagers with a 19-year-old guy for the rest of the week. Yes, I need you to take care of the kids. Can you do this for me? Lock in with me. I mean, kids were crying. Kids were scared. Even the adult sponsor was over there crying. I was like... Oh, okay, I guess. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. And there's basically four hidden wins in student ministry. Like, obviously, our, our number one thing is if we have transformational change, if a kid gets baptized, makes a decision for Jesus, those are huge wins. That's the whole reason we do student ministry. But also you have these kind of uh, subverse type of wins, too. If no kid dies on a trip, that's a plus, you know. If no kid gets hurt, it's a good thing. If no kid gets lost, it's a good thing. And if no kid gets left behind, it's also a good thing. Now, if you happen to lose the annoying kid and switch them out with a cool kid from another youth group and bring them back home, maybe the parents will thank you. I'm just kidding. So um, I went through the week, and things went well. It went, I'm going to be honest with you all. It went pretty good. I thought I was feeling good about myself. I was like, 19 years old, just finished a youth trip. Bet you nobody else in my freshman class is doing this. I'm going to, like, brag about it in all my ministry uh, classes when I get back to school next semester. And, and we, we get back home, and Matt calls me up, and he says, hey, we need to talk. Can you come over to my house? So I come over to his house. He's in a wheelchair. He broke his heel, and he broke his tailbone. And so it was a really sad summer for him. But he was all jacked up in his wheelchair, you know, like the right side of his body was shot. And he was like, hey, we need to have a talk. And, and I'm very grateful for this intentional conversation. And, and he, he says, come on in. And, I, and he says, Matt, I, I want you to know that you did well. And I was like, dang right, I did well. I did great, man. What are you talking about? And, and he said, no, no, you did well. But you didn't do what I told you to do. What do you mean? I took care of the kids, Matt. The kids are all here. They're all safe. We got the same ones. Nobody got hurt. Nobody died. No, 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 no. What's this I hear about you doing burnouts in the church van? Yeah, that might have happened. What's this I hear about you doing burnouts in the church van with another student in the church van? It was the worship pastor's son. Doesn't count, right? Like, you know? And so it was one of those things where 
The one thing I had to do, I thought I did well, but I didn't actually do well. I didn't actually do well. I had fooled myself into thinking that I accomplished what I needed to. And, and really, I had put a kid at risk, and uh, it wasn't what he asked me to do. I am so thankful for that intentional conversation when we got back home because Matt looked me in the eye, and it forced me to understand, hey, you need to stop being a boy and start acting like a man, right? And, and, and so what we're going to have today is we're going to look at an intentional conversation in Scripture that's very similar to the intentional conversation that Matt had with me, but as well, we're going to have an intentional conversation, all right? And there's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of things in our world that likes to keep us away from these intentional conversations, but I want us to lock in in these next few minutes and, and really dial this home, okay? So the first thing is, is, man, we're in this new series called Does It Matter? And we're going to be taking a look at things that are essential to our faith. I don't know about you guys. How many of you guys like essential things? Essentials. And what I mean by that is, is, you know, if I'm doing a job and there's a bunch of little fluff things on the side that need to be done, I'm usually like, no, I don't need to mess with that. Give me the essentials. Give me what I need to make the job happen. Give me what I need to make the goal happen. And so essentials are great because they keep us on goal, they keep us on mission, and they keep us on vision. If we have all three of those things, we're going right through it. And so we're going to take a look at these essentials of our faith throughout these, uh, this series. And so the first one we're going to look at is this one. Does it matter? Discipleship. And I'm here to tell you guys, this is a five-minute sermon. Yes, it does. You're good. We can have it. No, I'm just kidding, right? We, we're going to take a deeper look at this. What we mean by does it matter discipleship? Um, I want to take a look at a piece of scripture. You don't have to turn there in your Bibles. This isn't going to be the main passage, but this is something that supplements and helps. Acts 11, 26c. This is about the first century church. The church that was literally right after Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. If there's anybody that would get it right, it's this church, right? Notice what it says here. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. I love how Andy Stanley says this. He's one of our greatest communicators of our generation. He says, you know, the interesting thing about this is a lot of times in our society, we'll flip those two, right? We'll think we're a Christian before we're a disciple. We'll think, you know, if there's one thing that classifies us is Christian. And if we can be really, really honest for a second, this term Christian can be a generality, right? And it can be something that we can kind of broadly put over ourselves and kind of hide behind a little bit. Christian can mean a multitude of things. In this day and age, it truly can mean, you know, what we theologically believe here. It could also mean that you're a universalist. It could mean that you believe in worshiping God with instruments. It could also mean that you don't. You know, there's a whole lot of different things that covers the term Christian. However, that term disciple, that's a dangerous term. Because that term is very pointed it's very specific, and, and in this context, the disciple of Christ, there is one thing that sets disciples apart from Christians. There's one singular thing that sets disciples apart from Christians. See, we can go up to somebody, and I, I wouldn't suggest doing this. This is seen as politically incorrect, but you could go up to somebody and say, hey, do you call yourself a Christian? And they could take that a multitude of ways, you know. They could say, yes, I am, but, you know, and... and and we could come across someone who says that, yes, I, I'm a Christian, but yet they're only in church, you know, like on Easter and, and Christmas. Or, or someone says, yes, I believe in God. That makes me a Christian. You see what I'm saying? It's a little bit more of a generality. What I want us to look at is this specific tension here. It's going to come up on the screen. Uh, that tension is, rather than focusing on does discipleship matter, obviously, yes, it does. What this tension is that we have to manage, when does discipleship matter to us? Let me unpack that a little bit so we can know where we're going on this journey. When we say something matters to us, we can say it till we're blue in the face, just like we can say the term Christian. But unless we're actually living it out, unless we're actually doing something with it, unless it's actually something in our daily lives, then it doesn't actually matter to us, does it? I want us to take a look uh, at, at the meat of the passage that we're going to be looking at. This is John 13. If you have your Bibles, open up to John 13. 
And here we have a very interesting passage, a very interesting moment in history. I want to kind of set the stage for you so you understand where we're at. At this point in time, Jesus and his disciples have had what's called the Last Supper. If you're familiar with the Bible, the story of the foot washing has already happened as well. Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. And as well, the disciple who goes and betrays Jesus so that he'll get arrested and crucified, uh, Judas, he's already left the room, okay? So we're down to the 11 true disciples here. And, and, And Jesus has this moment where he realizes, like a lot of us, if we realize our time is short, he wants to have a very intentional and purposeful conversation with these guys. And so he kind of gathers the troops around. He says, hey, guys, look, I, I need you to understand something. And in verse 33, we see him tell him, hey, I'm about to be taken. I'm about to go somewhere where you can't go, okay? And, and I need you to understand this thing that I'm about to tell you. Let's look at verse 34 here. Again, John 13, 34 says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You, are, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, see, these disciples, they are Jewish in their faith. These guys, from the time they were 13, they knew the entire Old Testament. It doesn't matter, you know, in terms of what extra education they had. This was a requirement. And so these guys knew the 613 laws that God had given the people of Israel throughout that history. And so I think, we'll show it here on the slide, uh, the new commandment, when Jesus says, I'm going to give you a new commandment, I think their minds instantly went to Leviticus 19.18, which God tells us, love your neighbor as yourself. And I think the interesting thing is it might have given them some pause because they were thinking about this and saying, well, this is a new commandment, love one another, That's not new. Jesus, we've heard you say that to other individuals when you've been teaching. We've heard you say that throughout these three years that we've been with you. But notice the qualification that Jesus gives. Love one another as I have loved you. That second part, as I have loved you, makes it a lot more personable, makes it a lot more intense. See, that command has flesh and bone to it. That command has a face to it. That command has tangible action to it. And I think these disciples, initially their mind went to how Jesus had loved them and taken care of them when he possibly could have chosen not to or chosen not to show them grace. But also, more importantly, I think their minds went to stories. I think they thought about the woman that they were passing by in that crowded vi- village street, and she reached out and touched Jesus. And at that point in time, Jesus should have cursed her out. Jesus should have pushed her away. Jesus should have done everything he could have to stay away from her because she has been bleeding for multiple, multiple years. She was unclean. And everything in sociology and and everything in, in the society of that time would say, keep her away from me. Yet Jesus says, come here, my daughter. He had compassion for her. He loved her, and he said, you've been healed. See, the love of Jesus, it breaks down social barriers. The love of Jesus is something more than just a simple love we might have for our wife or husband, son or daughter. It's something more than that, right? It goes beyond what's cognitively logical. I, I think about the fact that also these disciples, they came up one afternoon as they were coming back from some food that Jesus had sent them away for. They see him with a woman at a well. And this woman was very obviously an outcast of that society. There's no other reason she should have been there during the day other than she didn't fit in. And Jesus took this time to share the gospel, but the Bible also tells us that that specific woman, because of the love and grace that was given to her, she changed the entire countryside for the name of Jesus Christ. I think about the time where a woman was dragged to Jesus, and honestly, she was worth nothing more to the people that dragged her there than someone who could be sacrificed to make a point and taken advantage of. She was caught sleeping with another man that wasn't her husband. And they asked him, they said, hey, what do you say we need to do with her? Because the law says we need a stoner. And Jesus said, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And he told the woman to go and, and live her, leave her life of sin. The love of Jesus is a very powerful and a very j- dangerous thing. It goes against norms. It goes against what in some societies might be okay to do. It takes the higher road every single time. 
And, and so I think in this room, if you imagine these 11 guys and their leader has told them, hey guys, it's not much longer. I'm going away. I don't think they understood the full extent or the full content of what was going to happen to Jesus at that time, even though he had alluded to it in previous instances. I think this new commandment sat heavy on their heart. I think it was hard for them to follow. Not because it was complex, but because of how dangerously and wildly Jesus loved. Let's continue on here. I want you guys to look at, at, at verse uh, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have one for love for one another. I think about this often. And I think about how many times we can get caught up in different things. And notice what Jesus says there. Not by how much scripture you memorize, not by how many Sundays you're in church, not by how many Bible studies you attend. All those things are good. It's by how you love. And can you imagine what it would be like if we loved people more than any organization or more than any other group on the face of the earth? What type of impact that would have? I think about how many times I have conversations with people who don't believe in Jesus Christ, and, you know, we, we talk about the gospel, and we talk about maybe some reasons why they're hesitant or abstained from going to church, and the biggest thing is, you know, sometimes I just don't feel like people in the church love. Why is that even a thing? Why is that even something that people have to struggle with? Why is that something that keeps them away from Jesus? Does discipleship matter to us? I want to keep on because I, I think Peter's reaction here is a lot like my reaction. I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more. So continue going down uh, John uh, 13, verses 36 through 38. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where am I going? You could not follow me now, but you will follow afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord Jesus, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you've denied me three times. So many times I'm right there. So many times I'm right there where God is calling me truly to love people. God is there truly for me to disciple people, saying, this is what you need to do. And so many times I get distracted. And, and I, I think you can relate to this too where I, I see something that someone posts on social media and say, oh, I need to pursue that. I, we need to have that in our ministry. We need to focus in on how we can reach people through social media in our ministry. Or, you know, I need to focus on, on, on how I can have bigger events for students and how we can get more students out here and, and how we can, you know, make it bigger and better than anything they'll ever experience throughout the week. Or, you know, I need to focus in on counseling techniques. I need to focus in on how to truly help people when they come in with these issues and truly get to the bottom of what's going on and help connect them with Jesus that way. And God says, no, what I need you to do first is love. What I need you to do first is love. And how many times do we run into issues where, where God says, this is how you, they're going to know. This is how they're going to know. If you love like I have loved, then they will know that you're my disciples. And we settle for lame arguments. We settle for arguments over worship styles. Or we settle for things that the church is doing differently than we remember when we were younger. Or we're upset with how certain people preach. Or, or how certain different things are, are happening within the church. Why are we focused on that? Why do we get so focused on that? I think it's because Satan knows the absolute and total power of the love of Jesus Christ. And if we get focused on that and locked in with that, nothing in the world can stop us. In fact, the Bible says the gates of hell cannot prevail over God's church. I think about this, and I think about Peter, and being in student ministry, you know, what Peter says, it, it happens so many times, especially with middle schoolers. You know, you'll be going in a, in a lesson, and you'll be talking about a story, and, and you'll, you'll be building up, and you think they're getting it, and you think they're getting it, and all of a sudden one raises his hand and is like, hey, what's for dinner tonight? You know, like, just throws it completely out there. 
Peter was doing the same thing, and it was because he didn't want to have the force on his heart. And notice what Jesus says to him. He says, will you really die for me? Will you really die for me? I'm telling you what's going to happen. You're going to deny me. You're going to get scared by a middle school girl before the night's over. Okay, and, and the reality in this is this. How many times do we run after and say, we'll do this for you, Jesus. We'll do that for you, Jesus. We're going to do this. And it, it falls short. I think that one ingredient, being a disciple, the difference between Christians and disciples is that ingredient of love. Where's our love at? What are we loving? How are we loving people? You know, I, I was thinking about this and, and, and how to take this scripture and bring it into 2017, how to apply it to our lives, how to, you know, make some basic steps on what it actually looks like to love people. Because, again, love is a very general term. It can mean a multitude of things. So here's some application points I want you guys to maybe write down and, and remember from today. And this is what has to happen if discipleship matters to us, okay? So the first thing is this. We must invest in others with our hearts. We must invest with others with our hearts. We have to be investing in people. That's number one. And obviously, if, if discipleship is love, obviously it has to come from the heart. I, I think about a specific example. I think about uh, a group called Kokomo's uh, Moms Connect. And it's, it's something that our church does. And I think it's an excellent example of how discipleship comes from the heart. These ladies put it on every single week. And they have a place that's a safe place. It's a safe environment where moms can just come in and share and carry each other's burdens and let their kids connect and let themselves connect. And it's kind of this little discipleship group that's come out of it. And we've seen so much fruit from that and so much fruit from the love that these ladies have put on other ladies and, and giving them support and giving them care. That's what discipleship looks like. When discipleship matters, we invest with our hearts. Second thing, uh, I, was, I was floored this week uh, on this one. Uh, we must invest in others with our time. I want to take a quick moment and give a shout out to our sponsors uh, in our student ministry because, man, I tell you, when I think about the people who invest time after time after time, I'm talking week after week, day after day, late event after late event, you know, <laughs> even past midnight sometimes, and they do it all because they care about discipleship of the kids. And, and I've heard this before, you know, you want to see what matters to you? Where's your time spent? What matters to you equates to where your time is spent. And these people, I mean, some have been in years and years, some have even been in decades, and they've been continuously pouring into these students because they believe in the love of Jesus Christ and the power that it has to change and the power that it has to overcome. When, it, when I think about it, man, First of all, if you're a parent and you have a, a child in student ministry, I would highly encourage you to seek one of these people out. You know who they are and thank them because, I mean, what they do is truly amazing. Um, but the other hand is uh, this week I got a, a text from Todd Kirk, and Todd is a ninth grade boys life group leader, and he texted me and he said, hey, I just want you to know that we baptized Jackson tonight. And... Years and years of investment by Todd. That's what it took to get there, right? And I just think about that. How much influence and time he has spent in that man's life. And I, I'm not just talking about Todd. I'm talking about every single sponsor that we have that does this over and over again. When discipleship matters to us, we invest our time. The, the final thing, uh, when discipleship matters to us, uh, we must invest with others, with our community. And that might sound a little bit weird, so I want to kind of unpack that for you. Basically, we have the choice of who our friends are, right, and who we hang out with and, and who we're grouped with. And I think about our growth group ministry here at Chapel Hill. It's something awesome. And I, I don't know if many of you guys uh, know this, but we've been growing since January We've been growing by 28% um, in young families, and we can correlate that directly back to the success of our growth group ministry. These are people who decide to have time together each and every week 
to minister to one another, to learn God's word, and to fellowship together. And I can tell you there's real prayers that are, that are shared. There's real struggles that are shared. And, and we come together, and we have true discipleship there. I would encourage you right now, and in fact, I would say it further than that, I would implore you to become a part of a growth group because that is truly something that we are seeing that God is using in this day and age as a catalyst for discipleship. When discipleship matters, we invest our community. All right, and so I want to break that down again. So love, we can basically break it down to three parts. It's our heart, it's our time, it's our community. It's our heart, it's our time, it's our community. When we invest those three things, we can kind of use that as a litmus test of, is our discipleship working? Are we sharing the love of Jesus Christ? I want to lock in with this and, and, and kind of drive this home with you guys today. First of all, the answer to that tension, right? Remember that, that tension that we initially had, uh, you know, how can we tell discipleship matters to us, or when does discipleship matter to us? It's specifically answered in this. Uh, discipleship matters to us when it changes from something we should do to something that we are. I'll say that again. Discipleship matters to us when it changes from something that we should do to something that we are. I think about it oftentimes, and you go into a church and they talk about their discipleship process and, you know, they, we have these four steps or we have this and that out there. And it's, if I can be real with you guys, a lot of times it's church jargon. It's things that just get thrown out there because it sounds good. But I think here at Chapel Hill, we're extremely intentional about it. We want to have an intentional uh, lifestyle of it where we are breeding discipleship and it's constantly happening and we can't contain it. And, and so what I want to encourage you with is to move from this part of, oh, maybe I should do that, to this is something that I am. This is something that I am. And what I mean by that is investing your heart in someone, investing your time in someone, investing your community in someone. When we do that, nothing can be contained through it. Nothing can be contained through it. I want to encourage you, this, this summer, as schedules maybe clear up a little bit more, as, as there's a little bit more downtime, find one person. Could be a son or daughter. Could be a friend of your son or daughter. It could be a coworker. It could be a boss. It could be someone here in this church that is a new Christian. Find someone that will be your person that you're going to disciple. Find someone that you're going to invest your heart, your time, and community into. That person's going to be your family. Make sure that you come alongside them, that they can be connected with the love of Jesus Christ like they've never been connected before. And when we do that, that is truly when discipleship matters to us. Let's pray.